Chapter forty eight of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arlene Stebbins. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter forty eight. Madame de Maintenon. Born sixteen thirty five. Died seventeen nineteen. Saint Simon. Born in a prison of America, whither her father had gone as a needy adventurer, and where he died, Francie d'Aubigny returned to France a poor orphan. At Rochelle, where she landed, she was taken pity upon by Madame de Nuillon, an old miser, who degraded the friendless girl by making her keep the key of the granary, and deal out the corn to the horses. Going afterwards to Paris, her beauty, wit, and propriety of conduct procured her friends, and subsequently she married the famous poet Scarron, then a deformed old man. It was the custom for people who loved letters, among whom were many courtiers, to repair to Scarron's house, where they tasted of that wit and fancy which may be discovered in his works. In all this Madame Scarron participated, making many acquaintances, whose friendship, after Scarron's death, did not save her from being a burden on the parish. She afterwards found her way into the Hôtel d'Albret and that of Richelieu, where she acted as a kind of upper servant, calling the other domestics and reporting when such a one's carriage had arrived. From one thing to another she changed, till she succeeded in so charming King Louis the Fourteenth's mistress, Madame de Montespan, that she engaged her to take charge of her children. In this office she was in the habit of often meeting the king, who soon saw how much she excelled in learning and good sense the other women who had been devoted to his pleasure. Finally she was privately married to him. A woman of strong understanding, Madame Maintenon, had learnt, from the various conditions in which she had been, the art of pleasing, insinuation, complaisance, the use of intrigue, an incomparable grace, an air of perfect ease and self-possession, accompanied by a reservation and show of respect, which was the consequence of her humble birth, and so far natural to her, wrought in unison with a soft speech, the choice of appropriate words, and a species of eloquence kept within bounds. The prior times in which she had lived were those of precision and affectation, qualities which she retained and in some degree elevated by an air of dignity and importance, and which, being favourable to devotion, first inspired in her that feeling, and were laterally submerged in it. Yet with all the real character of her mind was that of ambition. She aspired continually after new acquaintances and friends, as well as new modes of amusement, accepting only some old confidants whom time had rendered necessary to her. This inequality in her temper produced many evils. Easily elevated, she rose to an excess of feeling. As easily depressed, she relapsed into satiety and even disgust, without being able to render a reason for the change, even to herself. After overcoming the difficulty of getting into her presence, one had to experience a volubility resulting from something which happened to please her, and presently a relapse into indifference, or something worse, so that it was a task for the visitor to know whether he was in grace or disgrace. She possessed also the weakness to be regulated by confidences and confessions, and to submit to be made the dupe of religious societies. The time absorbed by her visit to convents was incredible. She believed herself to be a kind of universal abbess, and concerned herself with the endless details of numerous convents. She even figured herself to be the mother of the church, weighing and estimating the merits or demerits of ecclesiastical officials not less than those of the female heads of convents. She was thus plunged in a sea of occupations, frivolous, deceitful, and painful, of letters and answers to letters, directions to choice friends, and all sorts of puerilities which resulted ordinarily in nothing. Yet, for thirty years of her life, she played her part so well that she was the king's most confidential adviser, and shared in the obloquy of some of his worst acts, such as the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. She was a virtuous woman, a devout and bigoted Catholic, ambitious and resolute, 
yet disinterested and charitable. Her published letters demand for her a credible place in French literature. End of chapter 48